when it comes to biohacking and pharmacological interventions, I always tell people, first look at a map of the human endocrine system, which looks like the New York subway system on acid, right? Whoa. Like it, trying to say input A is going to produce output B way down at the bottom of the chain is ridiculous under most circumstances. The only three nutraceuticals or right that ever work are caffeine, nicotine, and marijuana because the human, we evolved with them. Boom, 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 boom. What's up, everybody? You're listening to the Hustle and Flow Chart Podcast with your boys, Matt Wolf and Joe Fear. Check it. Wiki. What up, my friend? What's up? You can sing? Uh, of course I can. I just don't show it off for you. Yeah, well, let's hear it. I just did. <laughs> you missed it. You were talking. <laughs> that, that was the singing? For you. For you. There's vibrato in there or something. I think that's the term. I can't hear it in the headphones. I don't have headphones right now. You don't have Or I know on. they would sound, it would sound absolutely amazing <laughs> to you. All right. So yes. today's episode was one that Oof. you and I have been super excited for for a while. And I don't think it disappointed either. <laughs> <laughs> no, I want more. <laughs> This is it's leaving me to have actually even he even left us with wanting more and he's like this yeah. is actually really cruel and I don't know why I should be doing it or something like, <laughs> like but uh, yeah he left us wanting a lot more so um, yeah. maybe we'll bring him back in the future but today uh, and this is one of those episodes that like there's just these certain guests that I like personally want to prepare a lot more but it's genuinely out of curiosity I'm like yeah. wow there's a massive body of work from this person and I'm super curious about everything they're doing that like I just want to dive in and it's just like it's forcing so when like when someone like Stephen Kotler yeah. uh, comes onto our show or is booked I like shit I got two weeks go down the rabbit hole hardcore yeah. <laughs> this is one of those guys it doesn't happen all the time but Stephen Kotler man oh it yeah. Oh, this, I mean, this episode is like a mind bending episode. <laughs> I mean, like I it was, is. I was just getting takeaway after takeaway. So most of his work is in kind of a couple areas, flow and peak performance. And then the other is sort of futurism and converging technologies. And, um, mm -hmm. he does a lot of work with Peter Diamandis and, uh, he has a new book yep. called the future, future is, is faster than you think. Correcto. Yes. <laughs> Minus the correcto. That's not part of the book. Yeah. But yeah. Future is faster than you think. And it's uh, that's a co-author with uh, Peter, Peter Dumantis. And um, super, super cool book. Uh, if you, you know, you listen to some previous episodes that we've had, we've talked about technologies rapidly, you know, just everything getting quicker in yeah. all these different categories, these niches. But the book is really taught. And we don't go super deep in the book here. So I'm kind of telling you a little bit about it. And I think mm -hmm. you definitely should get it um it's a part of their trilogy you know him and peter wrote uh, abundance and then also bold yeah. and this is now the third book in that kind of trio maybe there will be more uh but the future is faster than you think we'll show how it's like you can actually combine these exponential technologies and uh systems and people and things and whatever and stack them mm -hmm. and why now things in like you know in in freaking what the flying cars personal rockets colonizing mars 3d printing 3g around the world vr blockchain like all these other banking healthcare food everything's changing yeah <laughs> and it's like changing so quick and we get into like even with like the COVID thing. Yeah, we talked about that a bit. Like vaccines. Yeah. Because no shit. Like I was talking to a doctor and he was like, yeah, vaccine typically take like 10 years. Yeah. No, and this is one of those <laughs> conversations where um, we got him on and we're like, okay, this is this is an opportunity to just like nerd out. So we kind of go in a lot of directions mm -hmm. in this episode and just, you know, you could just hear us being fascinated by the conversation and wanting to go deeper. And, yeah. and so this is sort of a fly on the wall conversation of us talking about futurism, flow, a lot of flow talk too. A lot yeah, of flow. Yeah. A lot of how to how to get into flow. How to can you get into flow synthetically using outside substances? He's got he's got an answer for that. And also, what are some other things we have? Uh, you know, we our brains default to negative, so you're getting you know, especially in these stressful times, it could be bad. But mm -hmm. like we talk about a lot of ways how to manage that, which will get you into flow. And so you can use these constraints right now, like being locked in your house or whatever, mm -hmm. <laughs> as like an amazing thing. Um, yeah, talk about flow activities, like your primary, secondary, and why your primary should never be your work. Yeah. So uh, if you don't know what that is, you better listen. A lot yeah. of cool things. I yeah. It's, he also told us huh? where what which country 
is <sighs> leading the charge in drone technology. And um, that's just an open loop you're going to have to wait to hear because it's not from where you think. That sounded yeah. like a very clickbaity title, huh? Well, it's true. It's in the episode, so we won't disappoint. We'll yeah. deliver. It's there. <laughs> it's probably not what you thought. <laughs> and uh, and a lot of things are benefiting from it, too. Yeah. Animals. Certain animals. We won't describe such. That because it'll too give too much of a hint. No, no. Animals, no. That's broad. There's animals everywhere. Yeah. Come on. I didn't say what type. That would give it away. All right. I think. <laughs> All right, man. Um, I don't know what else to say. There's a lot to to this episode. It's absolutely amazing. We're I gotta better give a sh- keeping these intros short, so let's keep this short. I got to give a shout out to Lisa Byer and Will from Ojai, though. Like, yeah. uh, they they helped make this interview happen. They were mentioned. They are amazing people. Uh, just got to give a shout out. So they're awesome. Yes. That's all. And um, they all work together with Steven, too. So it's even cooler. Yes. Thank you, so, guys. And you. Um, we're taking notes on this one, as we always do. So you can go grab them notes over at hustleandflowchart.com slash comp. And we'll give you the, the Cliffs notes trademarked by them, not us. So <laughs> yeah, it's definitely not ours. Us. So go get the notes. Uh, be quick. Let's go chat with Mr. Cutler. Steven, we're live. How you doing? I'm well. How are you guys? Doing amazing. And uh, it's great to see. You know, we have a video of you now. We've figured out the, the tech <laughs> snafus with Zoom. Some of this exponential technology actually fix video chat, especially during <laughs> COVID. I mean, that would be nice. <laughs> but, well, oh, well. I'm, I'm, sure, it's okay. I'm sure that's what the 5G stuff that's in the works is going to fix for us. But <laughs> right? it is, mm. right? I mean, like, w- w- all, they, all we need is Elon to put up fast satellites faster. Yeah. Right? <laughs> that's, Going pretty damn quick right now. It seems they are, like. go, they are going really quick. It's like a long day. Uh, there, yeah, well, there's five. There's actually five. It may be six at this point. Different orbital constellations going up, right? Including Google's Loon, right? Which right they're launching, and you can right and, and now. So maybe so that's suborbital, and there's five going up um, <laughs> above that. That's you know, I mean, it's everybody's. Yeah. If they're talking about ubiquitous global five G within a couple of years, and it, it looks yeah. like it. It does, yeah, hundred percent. And then probably on Mars too, way sooner than uh, we thought too. It seems like all the countries. Oh, that's that, like was the next, race. that was next Thursday, right? Yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 I thought I got like. a text. <laughs> right. I already have a reminder set up. Make sure I'm there in time. I got an alert. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. All right, it's fascinating time, man. And I think like you're like right. Right in the middle, and it sounds like it's kind of engineered, but also obviously you had some background, you know, that got you to this point, you know. So super fascinating. We've been looking forward to this conversation, and you're probably busier than ever too. I would assume, <laughs> <laughs> you know, digesting all the information. Uh, how are things for you right now, actually? With like, I feel like with COVID, a lot of us are thinking of flow states of the tech and all the changes happening. Yeah, I you know it's a very it's a funny time. Uh, uh, the Flow Research Collective uh, is literally bus- we're busier than we than we've ever been. We're absolutely operating at capacity, completely across the boards, and and we keep hiring people, hmm. um, which I think speaks to uh, one the science around flow and around human peak performance. Right, our focus is on the building the best science-based peak performance training in the world. And I think the, you know, group of 30 or 35 people who work with me to do this, I I think we're, um, I we're best in the world. There may be organizations that are as good um, with different folks in those roles, but I like, I'll take my team Mm -hmm. um, really on that one. And it's so uh, crises in general are really phenomenal for training peak performance, right? Mm -hmm. We, Fear is ramped up. And when fear is ramped up, norepinephrine is ramped up. And norepinephrine is foundational learning. It's the first thing, like when information comes into the brain, goes into, you know, a couple of places and goes to the amygdala, hmm. which is our threat detector. But before it even gets to the front end of the amygdala, what's known as the lateral amygdala, has a bunch of norepinephrine. And all it does is anything that shows up there, the brain is already determined, oh, this is interesting. I should tag it. I may want to learn it and remember it for later. Norepinephrine is that tag. Hmm. Um, that's heightened. The norepinephrine in our system is heightened during crises. It makes it easier to remember bad experiences, right? We all know this because we right. learn from bad experiences. But it also actually makes it easier for habit change. Charles Duhigg wrote a little bit about that on the power of habit. It was a really great time for that. And a lot of the work from home challenges, in a sense, um, that people are facing, they're phenomenal for creating a high flow lifestyle. Like you've yeah. been 
forcefully put into a situation that it may feel like chaos, but if we give you a handful of tools, and I really mean a handful of tools, you can actually start to sculpt it and really use it for peak performance. So it's a really good time for doing this work. Um, and I think people are recognizing that. And on the other side, you know, the work I do on the sort of exponential tech singularity, like mm -hmm. that side of it, um, you know, Peter Diamandis, who I co-wrote the new book, Futures Faster Than You Think With, we were in New York in the day faster launched was the day the news of COVID broke. Oh my God. So we were lit we we're in New York and like, all, all the TV people are trying to figure out what is this thing, right? We're ready. We were talking about it, I think, three minutes after it happened, right? <laughs> Peter's, a Peter's a doctor, yeah. right? So, like, they're, they're, people want to ask him questions. And I remember looking at him, and we knew because uh, a virus is an exponential, right? Mm -hmm. So, we knew what was coming, maybe better than some of the other people. And you know, we, I said, Peter, you know what this means for, like, two-thirds of what we wrote about in our book? I was mm -hmm. like, I think – you know, the future is faster than we thought, yeah. <laughs> no right? which is what, which is the, which is what, what happened. Um, especially with, you know, certain healthcare longevity, certain there's been explosions. Oh yeah. Yeah. And just what with research alone with the vaccine, what I was actually talking to a doctor, not a vaccine type doctor, but he was like, typically it takes about 10 years from what I've found. And they're yeah, saying so, now by the end of the year, like, is sure, that? <laughs> this is this. Is, so I, I tell people this, this is, I was talking about this earlier on. I've been talking about it a lot, but I said that if you want to look at COVID, you got to look at three pandemics. You've got the first one, which is the real pandemic. The second one, which was the pandemic of fear unleashed mm -hmm. by it. Right. And I, we're still seeing that in various versions. And then you see the antidote pandemic, which is the pandemic of cooperation. Mm -hmm. Right. And in the beginning, this was nothing more than like, science going up in every freaking neighborhood in the world that said like need help need vegetables need anything i'm your neighbor call mm -hmm. me right like that was every neighborhood you could possibly go to so we saw that we also saw the science community as you pointed out cooperating like like science you, you ever want to see what a true competitive environment looks mm -hmm. like go to a science conference right oh. forget Forget football, forget basketball, forget <laughs> sport. Go to a freaking science conference. You'll, you'll, that's competition. Um, so the fact that like scientists are sharing information, nations are sharing information, and the result, to get to your exact point, I don't know what the number is today. The last time I was checked was about five weeks ago, mm -hmm. but there were 81 vaccines and cures already in trials. Wow. As you pointed out, it takes you know, one to $7 billion on average to get something that far, you know, to get it to, to, into, you know, that end of the pipeline. And it's a 10 year developmental timetable is general. Now, a lot of, it's funny because a lot of what keeps that really slow, like of all the things we're talking about in the book and in, in that book, healthcare is actually an, 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 a challenge like COVID is fairly low hanging fruit for where we are technologically. Mm. It's really interesting because we're having a, a global problem that you can make a good case for will be gone completely 15 years from now, 10 right. years from now, right? Like yeah. all the technology to surround this problem and get to it before it ever turns into a threat like this. Again, we've got, it's now it's a question of scaling it up, mm. but it's already here. Um, and we're seeing that this is the first display of that. Yeah. Yeah. This is, <laughs> I love it. We just jumped in the deep end. This, <laughs> this is the shit that we wanted, man, and <laughs> expected too. Because like I had this, I think it was keeping me up at night. Just this, like, what happens after COVID? Like, no one's even thinking about that, really. Like, you're, we're so consumed. Like you just said, with I, I will tell you something that I yeah. think is interesting also about that that I don't think anybody's pointing out. And I and I also want to say before I say something interesting, <laughs> I don't work on culture. Right. I work on the neurobiology of human peak performance. I write books. Mm -hmm. I run an animal sanctuary. Right. Like I have really great knowledge on psychology, neuroscience, animals, and writing. That's yep. my expertise. <laughs> and then I expand into exponential technology. And that's the bandwidth. So I don't know shit about culture. <laughs> I don't know shit about politics. But what I, one of the things that I have noticed, because you can't do the work that I've done with Singularity University and Peter and without realizing that a lot of times when people talk about the gap between rich and poor that's widening mm -hmm. and widening. Now, there are millions of causes for that, and a lot of them are not what I'm talking about, but a huge chunk of that that nobody is looking at is the fact that, and the reason the middle class is so gutted is it, it's not about a 
a rich, poor division. It's not about anything other than you can't keep up with technology. Mm. If you did not start to digitize your business in 1995, right? Mm -hmm. You didn't, you are not, you are, you have not kept up. And, you know, as a guy who works with a lot of companies all the time, I can, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Very few people, right? Unless you're in Silicon Valley or trying to work like that, you're not doing this, right? The entire middle class is a, is a middle class that they prefer safety and security. That's the whole point of the middle class. Sure. You like you're conservative. You like to conserve tradition you want, right? And as a result, you tend not to be early adopters for technology and you did not digitize your business. And as a result, you're incredibly vulnerable and the middle class, the middle class isn't going away, mm -hmm. but the middle class that did not digitize is completely gone. And what is happening because of COVID is the middle class that has not really kept up with technology for 25 years suddenly has to. Is keep, so everybody is digitizing their business and we may, again, I know nothing about culture, politics, is it, right? Not my <laughs> field, but what it, I am starting to see is a lot of people figure out what people have already done this. Wow, it's actually remarkably easy to work from home. Wow, this mm. technology is really great. Wow, if I create a digital product, I can make a million of them and my cost is zero, mm -hmm. right? Like these are kind of foundational rules of, of doing business that way. And there's an entire middle class that is being forced to discover that's one thing that I think is going to happen after COVID is we're going to see, we, the economy may wobble, all those things may happen, yeah. blah, blah, blah. But I think we're going to see a rebirth of the middle class because of this, because we've got a, a, a situation that is forcing my 80-year-old father to figure out how do you use Zoom? Yeah. Yeah, how do you sell true. life insurance online, right? Like all these things, he doesn't, he's 80 years old, he didn't want to. You know what I mean? Like, no, he doesn't want to change now. He didn't want to change. He didn't want to change. And I mean, he was 55 when all this started. He didn't want to change then, right? Like, I don't blame him. Yeah. That's, you know, it's a lot of years. It's a long time. I get it. But um, suddenly, uh, you know, suddenly my mom is like, dude, texting is cool. I'm like, yeah. You're yes, like, it is, time, Ma. yes, it is. Yes, it <laughs> did is. you figure out emojis she, yet? You she did. Dangerous. She's got she got one of those customized emojis that sort of looks like it freaks me the fuck out. <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't even know what to tell her. I don't know what to tell her. You don't want to tell her to stop. Oh, like, well, here's the weird okay, here's the weird thing. Uh -huh. Here's the weird thing. So my mother is a seventy eight year old wonderful ancient Jewish woman. Uh -huh. um, and she sent me this customized emoji. I have a friend who's gonna go name this here, but she's a thirty two year old. She always has sort of reminded me of my mother a little bit mm -hmm. in my dealings with her, but she's like 32 <laughs> and she's got purple hair. And so my mother's emoji has silver hair, gray hair. This woman is sending me the same exact emoji, <laughs> customized emoji that my mother is using. <laughs> got purple hair. And there's like 40 years. Of, I don't even know what to say to them. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, it's so creepy. I don't know what to do with it. It's really creepy. Just uh, maybe settle it in your mind. You're like, yeah, it's this like is a, <laughs> like. I've been stalked by real stalkers before. That's frightening. Emoji stalkers, though. That's that's fucking next level. Yeah. <laughs> Think about the trolls on that one, huh? <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, the emojis weird. don't really convey it's, age it's, very well either. They're all no. kind of very universal. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, you been, uh, yeah. what do you got over there? <laughs> no, I was, I was going to make a comment about how I feel like the world like after COVID is going to feel very similar to that movie Wally, -E, where everybody's like mm. fat and in chairs and all the food and entertainment is just like being fed to them. Like that's sort of my fear of what's going to be like afterwards is because we're, we're sort of getting used to like everything's coming to us now. Like it, mm. the, the world got so easy for us to just sit in our house, sit in front of our screens and have all the shit just brought to us. And I'm a little that. worried about the, the, the consequences of that. One thing for sure, um, all the technologies, right, on faster, there's a lot of like drone pizza delivery, right? Mm -hmm. Robotic pizza delivery, which is dominoes is involved in, but it's really being like rolled out in Europe already and blah, all that stuff, autonomous cars, um, yep. all the, it's going so much faster, right? We're going to have drone delivery across. I heard this is when I hear that this is the craziest thing hmm. I've ever, I'm, let me ask you a Literally, I will give you any of my books signed, like a stack of them, if you can answer this. Uh -oh. Either of you. What country now leads the world in drone, in drones, drone design, drone building, drone testing? Where is the hub of the drone universe right now? 
Oh, it's got, it's obviously not somewhere that would be like the first to pop to mind. I'm going to think, uh, for some reason I'm thinking Israel or, but then I'm going to like Belarus, like some like really <laughs> off, like some country. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. For some reason, the first thing that popped in my head was like South Africa or something like that. Something oh, you're like getting that. very close. It's <laughs> Rwanda. Mm. Oh, wow. Okay. Rwanda. Yeah. And the reason is they've got no, first of all, there's no roads. 50% of the country has no roads. So they need drones, right? Mm. So the drone, a lot of the drone, um, Companies that were testing drones for medical supply delivery and emergency supply delivery were testing in places like Haiti and, and Rwanda where there are no roads. There's no FAA. Yeah, well, uh-huh. also, right? I think uh, kind yeah. of doing a lot of work in Africa to try to like prevent poachers well, through the, drones. And yes, that's yeah. the other reason. Poaching, through, that's the other reason. And there's no FAA, so there's no overflight regulator. You can fly the fucker, mm-hmm. fuckers anywhere, right? So <laughs> you can it. do yeah. all kinds of tests. So, for, so first of all, Africa spick, skipped a whole generation and landlines went right to cell phones. Yeah. Same thing with banking, right? They went right to e-banking. And now they're going right to drone delivery. Like they're bypassing <sighs> roads, taxis, buses, trucks, all of it, and just jumping to dr- drones. And I, I want to point out, by the way, when you talk about exponential entrepreneurship, that if I would have asked the worst genocide in the world out post World War II, mm-hmm. essentially, was Rwanda, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? Yeah, if I, right. If you want to talk about exponential entrepreneurship in dire conditions, of, right, like how it can work and what it can actually do, holy crap. Mm. And the cool news, by the way, is uh, the Virga Mountains, which are in Rwanda and have the mountain gorillas and have been, their territory has been shrinking and shrinking and shrinking yeah. and it's been a huge problem. A lot of the drone money is being repurposed into environmental causes. And now Rwanda's national parks are some of the best in Africa. <laughs> so drones. you're getting I a love radical yeah. turnaround <laughs> thanks to this stuff. So yeah, I was just... Co- yeah, post COVID, it's interesting. Post COVID, yeah, and, and what's cool with COVID, I would assume, right now, for the right, you know, perspective, and, and I think it's, it's always constra- funny when you start a statement. What's cool with COVID? Well, I mean, <laughs> it's the constraints of it all. You know, yeah. it's, it's like it's kind of the sounding of what I'm hearing you say is we're all constrained in some way, but it's up to us on how we use our con- constraints for better. Yeah, and you, I, everything we know about creativity research, neuroscience of creativity research, innovation research. Um, I write about, I've got a book coming out uh, in January, my new book on, it's everything I've ever learned about peak performance. It's Ooh. called The Art of Impossible. It's uh, one book. Nice. There's a, obviously a lot of stuff on creativity. And we know limits drive creativity, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Limits are phenomenal. In fact, nothing is worse than an, a, a blank page and yeah. you know, no constraints, right? You're screwed. Mm. Every great creative flowering the Renaissance took place during, you know, that crazy time of upheaval. Shakespeare yeah. was writing in between plagues. Yeah, right? that's right. <laughs> people forget people forget this, but like Shakespeare is what happened when they opened the theater after like, right? He, why did he write so many goddamn plays? Because the theater was closed for three years. <laughs> as a play, He's been banking them. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Only thing to do, write plays mm-hmm. and sleep with other people's wives. So you can't <laughs> to write about in your plays. Yeah, it's apparently. pretty fruitful. Yeah. <laughs> very creative period. Yeah. yeah. I love Love it. Yeah, but but again, it's like it's how you use it. You could yeah. veg out and just demand food all the time and not <laughs> learn how to maybe cook your own damn food and you know, maybe you know, some some passion that you're trying to grow or skill, you know, don't veg out in front of the TV, of course. But so many entrepreneurs well, that we've worked with, like they've now I feel like the good businesses have just gotten amazingly better, you know, exponentially better because they've kind of prepped themselves, like you said, since the nineties, but the other ones, it's quick to fall off right now, and it's it's. I sucks. like if you're in, like I feel bad if you're in commercial real estate. Yeah, right. Yeah. What, like I don't I don't know what to tell you to do. You know what I mean? I have I've got like get out. Mm-hmm. You know <laughs> somehow heliports. Somehow, I mean the the are not yeah, the heliports. I mean or or start to you know be on the cutting edge of what is a we can I mean we you can. We have bio sniffers. They uh-huh. exist. Uh-huh. I mean, they're not. This is not pie in the sky. We can sniff the air. We can sequence path. You can build totally safe office buildings if these are your issues. Um, we yeah. just haven't done it. Mm-hmm. So until that starts happening, that's a difficult business, right? For the it people is. who are going to be on the cutting edge, what's the what's the skyscraper of twenty twenty one? It's a whole new ball game. Could be three D printed, and you know, yeah, even the construction well, company could be <laughs> completely. Well, that's, I mean, that's yeah. that is the other thing, right? The China. We talked about this in the book. There's this yeah. Chinese company who put up a 
I'm going to get it wrong because I always, I always think it's smaller than it was. It's something like a 139-story skyscraper in 19 days. Yeah. They used modular construction and 3D printing, and they built, a, I want to say it was two stories a day or something like that. Maybe it was more, 10 stories. It was some uh-huh. unfathomable, you know what I mean? Like Ooh. you built a skyscraper <laughs> in 19 like, days, 90 days, <laughs> like less than a month. I like I've built that. I built an office once. I built like, I wanted to build something with my bare hands. So I, I built like a 700 square foot office with a friend of mine over a summer. It was a great office and I worked out of it for a, a long time, but it took like us three freaking months to a build, summer. you yeah. know, like a whole summer <laughs> working 12 hour days, right? Just to, and, Hope, hopefully you had some fun. <laughs> yeah. Just to tick a box, right? <laughs> yeah. I think when, when I read the book bold, one of the most fascinating things that came out of that book for me was the, the potential for 3d printing for satellites, mm-hmm. right? Like the ability to sort of like email a satellite to the ISS and then have them printed out and deploy it. Like that shit is crazy. Yeah. That, that's that where we're getting. Is, well, that we're, I mean, made in space is already there, right? So like in, but right, that was the difference. In, in, we introduced them in bold, but in faster, the freaking printers up there and working. Mm, yeah. And those, those micro swarm sats, um, uh-huh. are printable at the, at this point. Um, it's, yeah, it's, and for what it means for, I get, God, I guess I could see the words colonizing space out loud right now without seeing crazy. Anymore. I don't think you're a weirdo like, anymore. Like, yeah, for a long time, you couldn't say something like that. Cause like everybody out loud, cause everybody's just like, come shut that. And I'm like, yeah. no man, like, no, no, no. <laughs> they're going to do it. Yeah. Like, whether there's start you know, with the moon though, maybe not Mars, but the well, moon's I, a little yeah. bit. <laughs> I, my, and I, and I, you know, it's going to be. There's really good cases to be made, and this is sort of Bezos' plan also, because he was influenced by the same guy, that you just you want to build space stations, huge mm-hmm. space stations. You don't actually planets are are cause all kinds of problems. I obviously I space is not in the same category as science, neuroscience, <laughs> animal, the things I know about it, you yeah. know. I know what I know about from space, I learned from Peter Diamandis. Mm-hmm. Though I did learn how to, I, I did learn, somebody once taught me rocket science. They were like, I can teach you all of ro- everything you need to know about rocket science in one sentence. What? And I was like, and it was a serious rocket. And I was like, okay, what is it? He's like, check it out. Big flame, small hole. Everything else is steering. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, Okay, yeah. you win. <laughs> Understood. And rockets, I, I got it. Well, Check. yeah, it, it's that and making sure the shit doesn't fall apart when you make the big flame go through yeah. the small yeah, hole. That's pretty much it. <laughs> Keep it together. Yeah, yeah and a whole oh, yeah. team of people that Apollo thirteen your shit from back home when it goes wrong, yeah. and you've got like duct tape, a thumbtack, and a tic tac. Yeah. <laughs> like, what right? do I do now? <laughs> oh my god. All right, so I don't know how we got here, but I love it. Um, <laughs> I'm not really letting you answer any of your, quest- ask it's any okay. your questions. I'm just- <laughs> this it's is fun. how we flow anyway. We just like to see right, where the conversation yeah. naturally goes. So we're, we're... Yeah, and I mean, at the top of this, like, yeah, we have a bunch of entrepreneurs listening. They're going to be fascinated. This is just humans should be fascinated with this kind of stuff that we're chatting about right now. But yeah, entrepreneurs in general, of course, you have the flow. You go so deep on flow. How long have you been in that space? now <laughs> um i started i started working on it in 90 i was just talking to andy newberg was my first mentor he was at the university of pennsylvania then and he was a neuroscientist and he, we were just talking about this and i we think i called him in 99 which means i've been working on it for a year already or a little over so nine since 97 wow, wow. um so i'm I guess I'm, it's, it's a while. <laughs> you don't need to do the math. It's cool. a while. I'm not yeah. doing the math. Yeah. It's scaring me. Um, 23 years. Yeah. yeah 23 yeah. years. Um, but uh, I, so it, it, the neuroscience has come so unbelievably far. I'll give you, here's the, the, the classic example. So one of the things that the neuroscience has enabled us to do is figure out where a flow state's coming from, what's mm. causing them, what's triggering them. And as the downstream of that, and this is the work we do at the Flow Research Collective, how to train them. Mm-hmm. So if you go back to the 1990s, like Flow, the original foundational work, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi Mihai did in the 60s and 70s, right? He wrote Beyond, Beyond Boredom and Anxiety, which was his first book. I think it was, I think it came out in 72, 74, Whoa. 76. And it's, hold on. <laughs> 
for you uh, listeners, uh, he has a whole bookshelf behind him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. I'm Feeling racing and book. grabbing a book just so we know when this is. Can you repeat his name? I've, I've heard it before, Mi- but yeah. It's Mihai Chikset Mihai. Okay, gotcha. Um, and uh, that was 75. So he must have started publishing that stuff in the late 60s, right? Wow. So in other words, this work has been around for a really long time, even to the 90s. And if you look into the data where people, well, could we train it using the psychology? Um, which was very well advanced by by that point. Uh, the hit rate was was terrible, mm. terrible, mm. right? Best in the world at this stuff, and they had very, very, very little success. And what success they did have, they found they couldn't repeat it or anything else because of the because of the neuroscience. Right when I got involved, right, we had just done the very first we the field had just done the first work on the first imaging study that looked at one of the phenomenons that show up and flow was Mm -hmm. just done. Um, And where we've come to now, when you go through any of our training, right, our our digital theater to dangerous training, we measure flow pre and post, and we're seeing on average a 70 to 80% boost in flow. Mm -hmm. This is, our Kung Fu is really good, (laughs) but it's, I've always say this, there's, when you're talking about peak performance, there's no such thing as a hack. There's only one thing. There's getting your biology to work for you rather than against you. That's the only thing you can do, yeah. right? And all this stuff that using the biology, you can get you, by the way, it's not always sustainable. There are problems. If you train up peak performers, they'll ever be able to get the 70, 80% boost. What mm-hmm. happens is most normal people have a substantial return to baseline. It has nothing to do with flow. It has to do with the flow massively amplifies um, the motivation triad of, of drive grid and goals, uh, creativity and learning. But if you don't have super solid foundations, like if your grit skills aren't really freaking dialed in and your intrinsic motivators, like if curiosity doesn't point to passion, doesn't yeah. point to purpose, doesn't right. If it's not all lined up and stacked, if you don't know how to think creatively, right? If you haven't practiced divergent thinking, if you haven't practiced finding multiple solutions to problems, if you haven't learned how to think about things from, right, I could train up all the creativity <laughs> in the freaking world in you, but if you don't have the skills, you don't have the skills, yeah. right? So what happens is if you do, where people wobble is not the flow stuff. That, because of the biology, we can really do something with that. It's these, and we have the biology and the other stuff too, but those, were, that, those tend to be the problems. The problem mm-hmm. isn't around flow though if i give you a shit ton of flow and then sort of it cuts off because your grit skills aren't lined up right yeah. or right um for example i've just given you a ton of crack cocaine and then taken it away cold turkey and it like it's a miserable experience right it's why um flow this stuff this work isn't for everybody it's, yeah. you know Matt, that I mean? answered one of your questions actually i think <laughs> the sy- synthetic way to get in a flow well cry cocaine there, but <laughs> don't do no, that no 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 so we ju- i will get there, there is no synthetic way and i but so let me two things on that one you guys may feel differently and some people in this space get very offended with what i'm about to say but i don't really care um <laughs> we offend our audience all the time so okay yeah. so when it comes to biohacking and pharmacological interventions, I always tell people, one, if you, if you first look at a map of the human endocrine system, which looks like the New York subway system on acid, right? Whoa. Like it, trying to say input A is going to produce output B way down at the bottom of the chain is ridiculous under most circumstances. The only three nutraceuticals or, right, that ever work are caffeine, nicotine, and marijuana. Because the human, we evolved with them. Mm-hmm. We evolved with these plants, right? So like, this is Michael Pollan's point in the botany of desire. Um, we co-evolved with them. They can work with our system. Those seem to be, those are the performance enhancing chemicals that we, that family that works. There's a couple other things you can sort of mimic caffeine with taurine and do a couple other things. But right. like, as a general rule, most of all the other stuff is sort of nonsense. And you're just mm-hmm. being lied to so people can sell you shit. But what, what about like, like microdosing psilocybin and things like that? So I wrote about it in Stealing Fire. I personally am not a fan of microdosing. Uh, it makes me irritable. It does not mm. boost creativity. It doesn't do anything. It makes my chest hurt. and makes me irritable. So clearly not for everybody. Um, some people get, are getting astounding results. Yeah. Astounding results. I know more 
sober, successful, wildly successful entrepreneurs, people like familiar names in the business community who have been microdosing every day for years, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's like, it's, oh, yeah. it's astounding. Um, and I don't like, that clearly seems to work for some people. I personally would prefer for the same thing, marijuana. I think marijuana is a better drug for creativity. And certainly if you're interested in flow, this is what you had Will on, right? Mm -hmm, so right. you probably talked about this. Oh, hi. Yeah. The, right. The, we know that, and this there's 70 years of anecdotal evidence and uh, starting to be actual real evidence because we're working on this uh, at the collective. Um, if you want a fake, like the fastest fake flow you could get is to combine about 20 minutes of light exercise so it gets quiet up here, mm -hmm. right? That's technically exercise induced transient hypofrontality, front end of a flow state with. Um, I used to say high grade sativa. Mm -hmm. Now I say um, marijuana that's very high in terpene, specifically limonene and a couple others that boost dopamine. Right? Mm -hmm. That's really um, an anandamide. Anandamide you'll get across the board from any any strain. But what you're looking for is the anandamide coupled to the dopamine boost um, and a cup of coffee. Ah, and okay. those three things they call it in in action sports they call it the hippie speedball mm -hmm. like they have for years, <laughs> right? Yeah. And it's, I mean, and action sport athletes have been using that combination, right? Let's do three warm up runs on the hill. And we'll go in, we'll get a cup of coffee, and we'll smoke a fatty, and we'll go back, right? Like that's, you know, <laughs> a cup of yeah. coffee, and we'll on the chair, we're smoking the fatty. And like, <laughs> every, I mean, people have been doing this for time immemorial. And, you know, there's a lot of neurobiology underneath it. it it's not, um, it's not a one way ticket. And it's not like, and, and there seem to be, Besides the, the pharmacological work that we've been doing with Will and stuff like that, there seem to be, in, in science, there's a lot of what, what are psychologists call moderators, if-then conditions. So if goals oh, yeah. they're seeking, for example, I'll give you one example. In high, when you're setting high, hard goals, a higher goal is the mid-tier goal, right? You have your big, massively transformative purpose. This is, I want to save the world. Mm -hmm. And then your high, hard goal is, I want to save the world by writing great books and cooking great food. Right, so you, so a higher goal might go to cooking school or learn how to write a level. Those kinds of higher goals, yeah. for high hard goals to be properly set, they have to be aligned with beliefs and values. Otherwise, and simply because one of the goals focus attention, and anything that gives you focus for free is phenomenal, right? Because mm -hmm. we burn a lot of our energy on focus. So goals keep part of one of the things they do is they give us focus for free. But if it's not aligned with core beliefs and values we're not going to pay as much attention to it, right. right? Like, yeah. cause it's, it's not us. So you can't really fake that shit at a biological level. It has, you have to do it. Um, so that's a moderator. I think one of the moderators that we're going to find it around THC is, um, if there's too much fear in the system, it won't, it won't, it doesn't seem to work. There's so, there's a woman mm -hmm. on my, uh, who I work with, Heidi Williams, who, who works with the collective, at one point she called me and she was looking at the endocannabinoid system and she said, it, so I have said for years that the endocannabinoid system promotes lateral thinking. Anandamide promotes the ability to find distant connections between ideas. And that is primarily based on the work done by an Italian guy named Greg Samarini. Okay. A lot of people have tried to duplicate that since then. And no, it's, it's hard to prove. Is it exactly lateral thinking? Is it something else? Blah, blah, blah. So there's something that I thought was true for sure and wrote about it in a bunch of my books <laughs> may not be exactly true the way I, I unfortunately, that's the way science works, okay. <laughs> right? But um, Heidi, she was like, dude, I think the reason anandamide is boosting creativity is nothing more than anandamide lowers fear and it, lo it lower, and we know this, like it directly works on the amygdala and it lowers. She's like, I think you're just less afraid to find wacky connections between ideas. And that's what happens. And I, hmm. it, it's not, it's not a bad answer. I don't know. My answer was, wow, that's really cool. Let's test that. Like maybe. Be, yeah. right? how, do, how do we test that? That's a really cool idea. Um, and I, and I, we haven't taken the next step, but it's a really interesting question. And maybe, it, it, maybe that's why marijuana boosts creativity. Maybe it's nothing more than like fear abatement. I think there's something more going on. But, yeah, because I mean, it could it could bring in factors like anxiety for the wrong reasons well, potentially. Or we all, we also know, for example, a good mood. So one of the best ways to hack creativity is be in a good mood. And the reason is when you want to far, find alternative possibilities, the part of your brain that does that is the anterior cingulate cortex, hmm. and it 
can only do that if you feel safe and secure. If you're not safe and secure, it's going to look for immediate solutions to your problem, right? Mm -hmm. If there's fear, cortisol, norepinephrine in the system, the AC is either, whoa, no, 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 we're going to be logical, we're going to be linear, we're going to solve this fucking issue, mm -hmm. right? But if you're totally safe and, and you time you don't have time constraints and um, your brain goes, oh, wow, I can just consider blah, 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 right? And that we don't think much of it, but we know, for example, all creatives, one of the things when they image the brains of eminent creatives, people who have had a lifetime of creativity, um, they find a number of different things. One of the things that they find is that in the brains of creative, creative brains exhibit what is called latent inhibition. If you're a psychologist, you call it latent inhibition. If you're a neuroscientist, you call it repetition suppression. Either way is, I'll give you an example. So if I put you, if you suddenly move to San Francisco and you live at the base of Lombard Street, the first time you walk by and you look up and it's all crooked, mm -hmm. you notice everything. Oh my God, look, it's so cool. The second time you look up, your brain actually, you get a diminished response. If I were to look the first time, neurons really fire. Second time, it's slightly diminished and your brain starts recreating some of it from memory and it doesn't give you all the fun. And by the fourth or fifth time, it's just the shit that's blurring in the background when you go in to get your coffee, yeah. right? That's repetition suppression. So latent inhibition is when information comes into the brain, how long does it sit in your brain before you judge it, before you say it means this? Because the minute you say it means this, it can't mean that. Yeah, you locked right? it it's into like, something. You locked yeah. it into something. Yeah. So create most people, it's really fast, right? People who have a long mindfulness practice, right? They get to slow that down a little bit. Mm -hmm. And in creative brains, you see it naturally slowed down. This is why when you talk about beginner mind, right? When people say things like that, mm -hmm. what they're really talking about is latent inhibition. That's mm -hmm. the ability, right? It's the ability not to determine this means this right away. Just to, and the brain is so fast, if you can delay it just a second, in brain speed and in what connections, right? That's, that's a massive amount of chain. So wow. that's, yeah. that's what this, one of the reasons mindfulness can boost creativity and, and, and blah, blah, blah. I don't have no idea how we got here. <laughs> we, we I, don't, got I, don't, here. I don't know, but that was, that was one of the big star things on my sheet here that I want <laughs> cause I, yeah, I've heard you talk about this. Um, well, okay. A couple of things. There's fear in there that came up. There's constraints. You said there's mindfulness. Uh, Seriously, based off of my research on some of the latest things you've been doing, I noticed you were doing you're doubling down on mindfulness, uh, things like breathing. And I've literally swiped what you said on a couple podcasts. I think it's like, okay, you know, five second inhale, ten out, or ramp yeah. it up, ten in, twenty out. That shit has done wonders for me just in the moment. Like I've actually practiced it a little bit right here too. Mm -hmm. For the heck of it. You know, and, and it just makes you feel good. You think clear. So like I'll give you a funny. I'll give you a faster one. Do this it, is from please. Dr. Andrew Newberman. <laughs> so if you look, try to look at the far corners of your eyes, like if you hold your fingers out to your side and try to see both of them at the same time, mm -hmm. just do that and breathe and watch what it does to your nervous system. You got to try to see out the far edge of your eyes. Yeah, Feel yourself like calming down. In front of us. Yeah. Yeah, do you, <laughs> yeah. You, another one. You, <laughs> yeah. Peripheral vision calms your calms you down automatically. Mm -hmm. It activates the parasympathetic nervous system. You don't use your peripheral when you're under attack, when you're scared, you focus. It's laser yeah. focus, right? So the minute you go to peripheral vision, you're, it activates the parasympathetic, the rest and relax yep. system immediately. And it's the fastest way we know of to do that. Now, interesting thing also, when you're processing information peripherally, this seems to happen in flow also, right? If you've ever been in flow as an athlete you tend to see a wider field of vision and, and right it moves a lot slower they even say that um, too a wider field of vision yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. it's because of this and what one of the interesting things is and this is part of what happens in flow when you're looking at things peripherally you process information four times faster whoa a lot of information processing takes place in the retina people don't realize that but the, your eyes are actually brain cells your eyes are part of your brain. They're just on the ex on the external side of it. They yeah. actually do information calculation. It's not a. They're not passive in that way. They they actually process a lot of data. Wow. Um, 
So Makes that's sense. actually, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's and it and, 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 <laughs> and people you say that and people think it, it's really mechanistic and it's really not like or it's, it's really they sound it sounds really high fluid and it's not like mm. how the brain works. It's really mechanistic. It's like filters. If if there's this kind of light, it can pass through. If it's this kind of light, it can't pass through. Right? Like it's yeah. that it's that mechanical. It's really really basic at, at the level of the pattern recognition. But I have no idea how we got here. <laughs> I mean, it makes a lot of sense when you think about like the the like real high speed, high danger sports. Like think of like uh, like motocross or something like that, right? The the rate at which they need to make decisions as they're moving around the track seems to need to be Look heightened. At, I mean, mm. high lie. The oh, yeah. freaking ball goes <laughs> yeah. two hundred miles an hour, right? You scared I mean, the shit like, out of me. <laughs> are you kidding me? That's a good, it's, very it's, good point. It's moving it <laughs> twice as fast as a fastball from a major league pitcher. Right. I've done racquetball before and I scare the shit you know, against <laughs> stepdad. It was like basically a pro at the time. I'm like, okay, no, no, I don't want to die. Yeah, I don't give a shit that you're a beginner. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, <laughs> thank you. You, you. you missed the opera term there, which was stepdad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's very true. Yeah. Very true. Um, no, we got there. I mean, uh, there's, there's something else that I thought was so fascinating is that the brain defaults to negative. And I think you said it's nine to one, maybe six to one it's like a range yeah that's sure. i mean i i want to uh it is it's six it's about nine to one is the research that uh sean Aker did at, at berkeley on this okay um other people have looked at it but it's really high uh six to one is what roughly what happens if you have a daily gratitude practice mm -hmm. that's what a gratitude practice does so it drops it, the negative side yeah yeah it's because you're 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 being thankful for things that are already true right your brain doesn't have to wonder you know, i am really happy that i woke up this morning feeling healthy it already happened mm -hmm. like it's a don deal my brain does so your brain goes oh it the world is a little less dangerous yeah. and so it can start letting in more positives which as creativity is always recombinatory you need novel information so if you're tuned towards the negative, you may be staying safer, but you're not, you're, you're create creatively innovating. your learning rates are going like so many things are going down. It's, mm. a, it's, a, it's, you know, um, yeah. not that you want false, uh, like I'm not a, you, the power of positive thinking is actually like, actually that's kind of dumb. You want to be optimistic, but you want to be realistic and that like yeah. you have to be both at, at once and that that's sort of the Kung Fu stance and the like, you know, you, yeah. When you're trying to like, like water, you know, yeah. <laughs> well, you're trying to put a, it's lipstick on a pig and your brain notices you can't lie to yourself, mm. right? You could tell the whole world, you could bullshit the entire world, but we all know the little voice in your head is going, shut the fuck up, yeah. man. That's just not like, no. <laughs> that ego. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, that's not your world, man. You're lying. Yeah. You're lying to them. It's a lot easier too. It's like you don't have to make shit up. You're just like, yeah, think about what happened yesterday or this morning, like you said, and just be thankful at the little things and start stacking them, you know, and you don't have to do the affirmation so much. I mean, if it works for you, I guess cool. Uh, but that's almost future. Yeah, you're make believe. You're kind of coming up with these not tangible things in the future. So, yeah, it's harder to trick your brain. It well, it's, I mean, it, it, it doesn't work. I mean, right? Like, you're, it may work for like visioneering works. But even that's difficult because the human brain has a very hard, t we have very limited time horizons and there's specific, if you want to try to imagine 10 years in the future, there's specific techniques to use because our brain does not like to do it. It's very, very mm -hmm. hard to plan that far in the future. I train people to have a, to have like two year time horizons to, to think in two year increments. Um, I think with today's technology pushing much beyond like, once you get past three years, I find it very hard to make any kind of real reliable prediction on anything. So I, I think, especially you know, after reading your book, you know, <laughs> what's, what's happening. Yeah. It's even more yeah. so. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, I think you even anyway. said something. There was like the further you get out, the less you're attached to like yourself. So you're actually, yeah, less you're, you're medial the into part it. Of your this part of your brain, the middle of your forehead, the medial prefrontal cortex, it does a lot of different stuff, but it does right. like creative self-expression and, uh, helps us choose action plans and things along those lines. But uh, when we think about ourselves, it gets really active. Hmm. When we think about other people, it gets very, it deactivates. And the farther away the other person is, you know, if you think about your mom, it's going to shut down a little bit. You think about, you know, a friend a little bit more. You think about that woman you met at the grocery store two weeks ago. It's almost right. Hmm. If you think about your future self five years from now, it's almost totally shut off. Your brain treats the person you're going to become as an absolute stranger. 
which is why it's it's one of the reasons it's hard to plan for the future, hard to save for retirement, hard to like hard to get not get a prostate exam because mm. you just <laughs> sign up, right? It's gonna help future you, right? Yeah, um, that's a good point, dudes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As as I as a guy who has to go get a colonoscopy next month. <laughs> <laughs> Do it. Yeah, we all we all we all kind of like aim for gratification now, but never really think of the preventative yeah. shit that's uh, gonna affect us in the future. I'm curious when it comes to to flow, how so when it when it comes to like flow states, it it feels like at least in, from my perspective, you realize you were in flow after the fact, but you don't ever really kind of realize it in the middle of being in flow. So so there's a yes, and it, so it depends, right? Like think about uh, baseball players, golfers, uh, skiers, mm -hmm. um, where like there's time in between the things. So a skier doesn't know there, you won't notice it on the hill. Mm -hmm. You'll notice it on the chairlift, mm -hmm. right? With for a writer, right? When I'm actually writing in, in it, I don't notice anything, right? Mm -hmm. But when I pop up five minutes later for whatever, for uh, then I'll feel it and then I'll drop back in, right? So you, you're right. And uh, Martin Seligman actually from the University of Pennsylvania, one of the one of godfathers of positive psychology pointed out in, I think it's an authentic happiness. Um, it's in the footnotes. He's talking about flow. And he said, you know, the interesting thing about flow is the state itself is emotionally neutral. Like it's everybody's favorite experience, but the experience itself is emotionally neutral. Emotions steer behavior. Flow is defined as optimal performance, right? Every action, every yeah. decision leads perfectly effortlessly for, to the next. And you don't need to you don't need to change behavior until you're doing everything right, yeah. right? So you don't need to modify behavior. So it's an affectively neutral state. Um, and it's only on the back end. And there's, so there's, uh, there's an argument. I, uh, I don't know if I agree with it or don't agree with it because I just don't think we, we know. But people have made the argument that on the very back end of a flow state in that afterglow space you get, mm -hmm. that – there's people who have argued that it's a ser it's serotonin. Um, and we know you have a lot of dopamine on the front end of flow. And usually dopamine and serotonin are, are sort of yeah. antagonistic. They're not in the system at the same time, right, yeah. As, a, yeah. as a general rule. Um, and so you know you have a ton of dopamine on the front end. But it seems that peaceful afterglow is serotonin that shows up as the dopamine start, starts to fade. Um, how the hell did I get here? You asked me a question. No, so I, I was saying at, I, I looked at you and you. Oh, uh, so I screwed it up. up. It's no, a pink I'm, microphone, right? No, we were we were just kind of talking about how um, flow. It, you you know, from my perspective, you kind of realize it after the fact. Oh, after the fact. Yeah. Okay. So Seligman said flow is affectively neutral, and we think it's only if the serotonin shows up. That's maybe when more of the emotions start to show up. Mm -hmm. Is literally that may be sort of part of it, but but most of it is you know, you're even, right? You don't, your mm -hmm. body sensation is gone. Your sense of self is gone. Everything's gone except the thing that you're doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm curious, how, how do you actually like quantify flow for the sake of like researching it and studying it? Like, how yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So there's, uh, depends what level of scale you want to come in. Psychologists define flow and have since chicks at me high, uh, with six core phenomenological characteristics. So complete concentration in the present moment, uh, t time passing, time dilation, time passing, strangely, self being diminished, the merger of action and awareness, so forth. So for what we do when we give you a psychological questionnaire is you've got a Likert scale, one through five, never to always. And um, how much did you feel your sense of self disappear, right? Those kinds of things. Now, that has its limit. It's proved remarkably robust over time and it has really worked and led to a lot of breakthroughs. Um, it's a little too soft and squishy for a lot of people, including us. Mm -hmm. um, so neurobiologically, there's an entirely different definition of flow. Neurobiologically, we are looking for things like deactivation of the prefrontal cortex, mm -hmm. right? So less activity coming out of this part of the brain, except for this spot, which gets hyperactive. Mm -hmm. Everything else, especially over here, very, very quiet. Brain waves will move down to the alpha theta borderline. So if we're looking for that, we're looking for um, five, well, some combination of five neurochemicals. And now we're starting to get really good physiological data. So we know 
that, for example, cortisol, stress hormone, goes up. Doesn't shoot crazy high, but there's, it seems like, so at parasympathetic, sympathetic activation, when the body wants to really fine tune a process, it doesn't give you one or the other. It gives you both at once, right? So you can, mm -hmm. right, you're, you'll have a better, if, you, if I've got a shower in my bathroom, my office, it's got one knob for hot and cold. <laughs> I've got two knobs in my house. Two knobs gives me more precise hot and cold than the freaking knob in my bathroom that I have to sort of stab there and adjust <laughs> the whole time, right? right, right. Yeah. So same thing with the brain. If you want to really fine tune something, you want both states at once sort of, right? And that's what it seems that flow does. So you get, we have, we know what some of your hormones are doing in flow. We know, um, though there's, uh, we're doing some research to try to try to prove this again, but there's work that came out of the Karolinska Institute in Sweden that shows that your frowning muscles may be paralyzed in flow and your smile muscles may be hyperactive. Whoa, so, so right. We, we heart, there's a heart rate variability signature for flow, et cetera, et cetera. So we're getting it really down to the physiological, what we're doing at the collective. One of our, our is we're working on a device, a biophysical based flow detector that's going to combine two different sets of neurobiological signals with some physiological signals and be mm -hmm. able to tell us. And, and just to give you an idea how fast this shit is moving, I would have said, forget us doing it. I would have said 10 years ago, this is not going to happen in my lifetime. Um, I would have said five years ago, it was a long way off. I think we're a year away um, in our organization and we're not the only people working with it. We're partnered um, with Adam Ghazali, he's at the University of California, San Francisco. He's got a whole research team that's taking a totally different approach hmm. to doing the same, right? There's like three or four, there's a, there's a, there's a team at the Platypus Institute doing the same thing. They're coming in through a different angle. So we are, the flow is a measurable biophysical neurobiological process um, in real time is wow. like, a year, year and a half, two years away. I, I mean, I could be totally freaking wrong because that's the way science te can go, right? You think you're right there and it turns out it's 20 years out. <laughs> you forgot right? to look at this there's little a, detail. Well, there's a great, there's a great, the first artificial intelligence conference took place, I want to say in 69. I'm going to get it wrong. Wow. Marvin Minsky helped host it. And they literally, it was held at MIT and they were like, oh yeah, we think we're going to, we, we think we'll, ha we'll, we'll crack it over the course of a summer. Like, wow. right? yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> so, so is there like is there a future where we have like wearables and we can like see like how long we spent in flow for the day? <laughs> yeah, it's, that's an interest. How that's actually, um, yeah, perhaps I don't see. Um, people ask me crazy tech questions all the <laughs> all the time, and I don't. I always tell people I don't do substances and I don't do technology. Mm -hmm. And the main reason I, you know, I. Every time I say this out loud, I guess most people don't nearly die as often as I have nearly died. Like, <laughs> You've been through I some interesting about, things. I, yeah. yeah, I was just talking about this with a friend of mine who's a professional action sport athlete this weekend. And like we say stuff, I say stuff out loud that most people think is outrageous. And <laughs> to like the community I'm in, they're just like, okay, it's it. That was Monday. <laughs> yeah. Right? But so I, I've been, I, you know, over the course of my journalism career, I was probably shot at four or five times hmm. um and at no time could i look at the guy wielding the gun and, and like excuse me sir would you put that down until i use this brainwave entrainment device and we wait for the <laughs> microdose to hit so i can dodge your bullets yeah that just, shit just doesn't work that way <laughs> right 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 you know what i mean like in my experience the times you need peak performance the most are the times you have like the least access to right. technology <laughs> or a substance you know yeah. like when it's really you know and so I'm interested in the psychological interventions that one work for everyone and are affordable for everyone. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pharmacological solutions and technological solutions have are at least now until the tech gets cheaper, they're cost prohibitive for mm. certain communities. And that's not interesting to me in general. I'd much rather like the biology works for everybody. Let's use that. Yeah. Right. That's and good. it works in real, right? Like that's, I'm much more interested in, in that approach. Yeah. No, you and I were talking before we hit record earlier about how like now is the time to focus on flow and the stuff that you're passionate about. What was the context oh, of that? Yeah, there was something that you said about the primary and secondary uh, states of flow. And then uh, maybe after this, we could kind of start to wrap. But you, you were saying something that it's, um, you know, 
your your primary focus uh, or flow is prim- primary flow activity is secondary flow to activity. secondary yeah yeah so this is not this is just terminology we we have this is not a this is not standard in the in the, you'll never find it in the psych- okay. scientific literature we use it the collective to describe a phenomenon that we've just seen over and over and over and over again in people we work with which is that everybody tends to have a primary flow activity which is usually that thing you did in your childhood that you just got lost in for fucking ever, mm-hmm. right? Like for me, it was skiing. For some people, it was dancing. For some people, it was, right? And or it, uh, if you don't make your, tend to make your living this way, later in life, it tends to be a creative activity. You play the guitar. You knit. You mm-hmm. like take your pick, right? Um, those kinds of activities, that's a primary flow activity. And the reason they're so important is – First of all, that when people get older and responsibilities start to happen, they're the first thing. It's the thing that goes. Yeah. It's the thing we cut, mm. right? And it's from a performance standpoint, it is the literal worst thing you can do for performance. One reason is flow is a focusing skill, essentially. It's a specific way of focusing the brain. And the more flow you get, the brain's plastic. Mm-hmm. So the more flow you get, the more flow you get, right? If I get into flow a lot while surfing, right? Mm-hmm. It translates the ne- literally the next mm. day yeah. into more flow in the office. We also know that the, this is Teresa Amable's work at Harvard, but the flow, uh, the heightened creativity you get in flow, different people have different numbers. We've tried to measure it a bunch. It's usually between 400 and 700% of an increase. It's a huge increase wow. in creativity, yeah. um, uh, primarily in divergent thinking, but uh, it uh, lasts a day, sometimes two after a flow state. So that's so, the primary activity. So you yeah, can, if you go into your prior activity, you know, you're create that heightened creativity yeah. in, and some of the heightened motivation and definitely the heightened peace, like the calm, it's going to persist mm. for a little bit. So that, but it also is the focusing skill. So, and in, in times of crises, like we're current, like if you want more flow in your life in the middle of COVID and everything else that's going on in the world right now, if it is available to you in a safe way, meaning like you're not going to go get COVID to do this, mm. um, double down on your primary flow activity. Yeah, because yeah. if you're if you've got if you're super nervous, you've got a lot of shit is scary. This is actually it's going to be like putting on a familiar s- sweat jacket, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a really it's a really good thing. And then there's your second, and you also I have found try not to work in your primary flow activity. It'll ruin yeah. it. Mm. It'll just ruin it. It won't be as flowy and it won't be as fun, mm. right? Um, and you, then, like for me, writing is my secondary flow activity. I'll get like I always say that like I go skiing. You have to usually have expert level skills for this to be true. But I've got expert level skills, and I go skiing, and ninety five percent of the time it's a flow state. Mm-hmm. There are usually two or three days a year that I don't get into any kind of flow state, and there and usually it's usually one is because I got in a fight with my wife. The other two times are because I've been traveling for weeks on end and I just don't, I like, I, I haven't stayed in shape. Uh, You know what I mean? Like I I might like (laughs) physiologically, I'm just not, I need to sleep. I need to eat. (laughs) I need to, you know, recover a little bit, blah, blah. But writing 60 to 70% of the time I get into flow when I'm writing, right? It's a secondary flow activity. Again, expert level skills, right? Because flow, it's automatized process. So if you don't have the expert level skills, that's why learning matters so much. You've got to keep being able to do that. But yeah, no, that, that makes so much sense too. Cause I know so many people that are like really high achievers in business, but they surf every morning or they, they do jujitsu like five days a week. So, mm-hmm. I mean, that kind of ties yeah, well, that we, together. I will, I will, I will <laughs> tell you. So we, this is something else we believe. Um, and we're starting to get more and more data on this, but it's going to take long-term studies. Executive burnout, right? Which is really difficult for everybody. Sure. Um, if you have a good active recovery protocol, not passive recovery, right? Not TV and a beer, but like <laughs> saunas, massage, Epsom salt baths, light restorative yoga, breathing, mind, breath, yeah. breathing, right? All that active yoga, active. If you have an active recovery practice and you are pursuing your primary flow activity at least once a week, provided you're Provided you're not in a work condition, the number one cause of burnout is like you work for a narcissist who is never going to like your work, mm-hmm. right? They're like, they're, cause it, that's what narcissists do, yeah. right? So like, unless you're, 
is as long as you can get sort of consistent and steady feedback, right? Yeah. Um, as long as that, this is a business that had to burn out proof your life. You will not burn out. If you have an active recovery protocol in place and a primary flow activity, we don't think you can burn out. Mm. Maybe you can, but um, it's as close to burnout proof as, as we can, as we can get you. And good God, is that a problem? Oh man. Yeah. Wow. Let's, uh, I think we end it there <laughs> because I think that's, this is so much actionable stuff, man. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I can we can nerd out, we longer, <laughs> but we won't right now. Yeah, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're approaching the hour mark right now, yeah. so I want to we want to be respectful of your time. I'm sure we could we could ask you questions for another three hours, but I that's uh, well, yeah, well, something actually I think that you've said on some other places, but you have a flow blocker quiz that you mentioned. Oh yeah, and yeah. I, if you yeah did did you take it? I did, and it n- freaking nailed it. And it was actually a few things I was already working on <laughs> collectively. Yeah. I haven't I taken like, it yet. Joe shit, Joe pointed it to me right before we jumped on this call, so I'll do it after the call yeah, put the put the put the for anybody who wants it it it's um we basically there's been a lot of work done on on kind of what are the biggest blockers for flow we yeah. have a pretty good list and then um we added a bunch of our uh our data um i think when we got to like a thou- the first thousand people we put through the course i think we started to aggregate that's when we started looking at this stuff or whatever it was a while ago yep. but uh so we found the 10 Biggest call, it seems to be the 10 main flow blockers and just built a diagnostic. It's flowresearchcollective.com forward slash flow blocker. Sweet. And yeah. totally free. Um, and yeah, it, it seems to be pretty damn effective for it, people. It's not right? only that, but the follow ups. Like, just, I mean, we're, we won't go into it, but flow channel. When you talked about flow channel, I think it was like first or second email. I was like, holy shit, this just makes sense. Like, especially as entrepreneurs, you're trying to achieve so much, but then basically the long and short, it seems like, oh, you just got to do like 4% the, better. The, yeah, you got to do 4% <laughs> better. And the other thing that I always tell people is um, if you're successful in anything, like I don't, I don't mean business, if you're good at anything at a really deep level, um, I not, and by the way, if you're a good cat burglar, if you're a good mm-hmm. gangster, this is probably true, right? <laughs> like just so, just to, to the full spectrum. You had to get. It, there's only the biology, right? There's nothing beyond the biology. So what we find is that when you start to train, like when people take our courses, who are successful on whatever, often most of what we're doing is just showing them they were stuff they were already doing anyways Mm. and saying here's the science and here's the framework this is why you were doing these things here's how to do them a little more effect like that's right that's it um i you you know as as far as i can tell though we're not gonna there's a teaser and then i'm not gonna gonna this is an awful thing to do to you guys (laughs) but as far as i can tell what we really mean by peak performance is six or seven things you have to do every day and about six things you have to do every week Mm. So you may have to be in the book, I'm assuming, right? Yeah, it's going to be in the book. And (laughs) I mean, but some of them are like, you know, some of them are no brainers. Like you have to get a good night's sleep every day. Right. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, you have to hydration, nutrition. It doesn't like it doesn't have to Move be fancy. The body exactly. a little bit endorphins. Yeah, I'm sure. Okay, you know. we'll stop there. <laughs> yeah, we're done. So, <laughs> so awesome. the 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 latest book right now is the future is faster than you think. Can you? Uh, what, what's the name of the upcoming book that you're you're referring to? The art of impossible. The art of impossible. Awesome. Okay, and That's it's cool. coming out in January January fifteenth. I think you can actually pre order it now. Somebody, I haven't seen it. Somebody told me the cover is up on Amazon, and you can now pre order it. I haven't gone to look. We have um, great researchers on our team, so we'll just have them source it for <laughs> us. I'm sure we'll find it. But seriously, I don't think nothing says Merry Christmas like the art of impossible. I would agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> I would agree with that. All right, Stephen. Uh, thank you so much for Guys, your time. It's thank been you. Honor. Thanks so much for tuning into that episode. I hope you dug it. I know Joe and I dug it. I actually kicked Joe out of the room. He's not here right now because I wanted to tell you about a tool that I really, really dig. We use it in our business. We recommend it all the time. It's called Easy Webinar, and it's a tool that lets you do live webinars, automated webinars, hybrid webinars, and, uh, you know, pretty much any other kind of webinar if there are other kinds of webinars. But anyway, this tool is kind of like your all-in-one do-it-all tool for anything webinar related. It's Easy Webinar. It's put out by a dude named Casey Zeman. He's been on the podcast. If you haven't listened to that episode, it's a killer episode. He's a really smart dude, but his software is amazing. It does everything. It's, you know, the title tells you exactly what it does. It's an easy webinar platform. And we use this in our business to run automated webinars all the time. We don't do 
a lot of live webinars these days. We like to do the kind of automated webinars where somebody can register and then it, you know, they can either watch it like 15 minutes later or they can watch it the next day, but it's just kind of always running. And it's a system that helps us make autopilot sales off of our webinars. Super cool tool. If you haven't tried it yet, you know, it's, it's, it's an amazing tool. And, uh, Casey is actually hooking you up. He said for listeners of Hustle and Flowchart, I can't believe he's doing this, but he said for, for listeners of the Hustle and Flowchart podcast, he's giving 25% off of the membership to use Easy Webinar. It's already super, super inexpensive for what it does and all the cool features it has, but he's hooking you up with 25% off because you're a listener of Hustle and Flowchart. Go to easywebinar.com slash hustle. That's where you can get that 25% off discount. That's easywebinar.com slash hustle. It's a awesome tool. You're going to dig it. So just go grab it. Check it out. Easywebinar.com slash hustle. See ya. No, not see ya. You'll hear me in the next show. I don't know. I don't know how to close these things. Go get easy webinar. Talk to you later. Thanks everybody for listening to this episode of the hustle and flow chart podcast for taking the time to listen. We want to give you something a little bit special. Every single episode that we do, we actually have somebody on our team take notes. We basically have a Cliff's Notes version of every episode where you can go and find all of the tips and tactics that they laid out, all of the resources that they laid out, all the good stuff from this episode. We actually have a nice, simple notes version that you can find on our website. So go to evergreenprofits.com, find this episode that you just listened to, and uh, give us your email address, and we'll send you the notes. Thanks for listening. <laughs>